Let's turn to Titus chapter 2. Um, you know, I heard that song years ago <clears throat> in a camp meeting. Some I was talking to one of the guys who was singing there, and he said, oh, i got a real pretty song when you like. He started singing this over to me. And he said, now this isn't like the music that it's written to. These are the words, but this is not the music. And uh, so he said, the music it's written to is terrible, but uh, the song is beautiful. The words are just, you know, uh, two or three years after I've been singing this, I got a hold of the music. And boy, was he ever right. You know how, how the music goes? I was in sin's prison, oh so dark and cold, and there's no lost sheep wandering from God's eternal fold. It's awful. I can do that now that you've heard how it goes. Da 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 da. I don't know how the author managed to put such trashy music to such good words. The words are tremendous, and with, with the right tune to it, it's got a lot of guts to it. But I just wanted you to know that some, every once in a while you may hear a song here that's a little different from what you've heard it before. Sometimes we change the music, and sometimes I write an extra verse. A lot of the good songs only have one or two verses, maybe, and they have two verses. Any good songs worth singing ought to have three. So several of these I've written two or three extra verses for them because they needed it. I mean, you get one that's got heart in it and got guts to it, you, it needs more, you need more time to develop it. This one had good words, but it just had a trashy tune. But fortunately, we found the other one works better. Don't you like it? Mm-hmm. <laughs> oh, me. Give you the heebie-jeebies. Just listen to it. All right. You say, well, I guess you're not into contemporary music. No. <laughs> There's some songs that are trite and trashy. And you can't set trite and trashy music and set Bible words to it and make it any good. It's still trashy. There's a dignity and there's a heart throb in music that God has given you notice the music around here, it's picked pretty carefully. We don't sing just everything. There's some stuff I don't sing because I don't like it. And I'm a dictator around here. Some stuff I just say, don't sing that anymore. Why? I don't like it. And uh, there's too many good songs to waste your time with something that's trite and trashy. Just because everybody else is singing it doesn't... Now, I, uh, I brought back I Love You, Lord Jesus... That's got a punch to it. Bang. Give me a heart. And they don't all have to be slow and that way. They can be up-tempo. I have no objection to up-tempo things as long as they don't get you jigging around dancing on top of the piano for no reason. (laughs) But the Holy Spirit gets a hold of you. Well, that's all right. But most of the time there's a spirit a hold of people that can be thrown out and should be. All right, let's look at Titus chapter 2. We stopped this morning with the first chapter. These religious folks came in, and they were messing up the work that God had done through Paul in Crete. And he's instructing Titus to take a very strong stand against this kind of stuff. Now, by today's lovey-dovey, sloppy agape standards, it would be wrong to take a strong stand against these turkeys that are coming in teaching heresy. But Paul didn't, he didn't mince any words. He said, just straighten them out. The, the antidote is sound doctrine. Rebuke them soundly that they be sound in the faith. He didn't have any patience with this stuff. This old soft cotton candy stuff, if there's nothing to it, I can see why they don't, they don't see any use in making any lines. There's nothing to be lined up for Oh, come join with us so we can all be under one blanket. We'll give up what we believe. You give up what you believe. That's like somebody doesn't have anything. They want to give up everything they've got, which is nothing. 
and have you give up everything you've got, which is everything, you know. That's like if I had a big chocolate pie and Frank said, let's share everything. I don't have anything, let's take yours and eat it. <laughs> uh, he, might, he might discover that I'm not completely delivered if he did that. No, Paul took a very strong stand against false doctrine being infused into a group of believers who had already been taught. And I'll tell you something else. These religious turkeys don't go around looking for the lost and down and out in the gutters. They don't go down to the missions. They, go down, they don't go down and haul them out, the lost and the dying. They don't go after those. They, go, they pray on the churches where somebody has already evangelized. Somebody else has already taught them. Somebody else has already got them to the Lord. And then they start nipping at them. They'll stand on the doorsteps of a church and hand out flyers. We've had them show up here trying to do that. They didn't last. <laughs> we don't put up with that kind of foolish. You want to give out you want to give out your particular brand of poison to somebody? Go gather your own crowd. You're not gonna poison ours. We're just particular. We have found what we believe is the truth and we're marching right on with it. People want to march with us, fine. They don't, they don't have to. That door back there opens both ways. Nobody invited you. If God didn't send you, goodbye. Blessings on you. We're not going to get mad at you. We're entirely too busy to get mad at folks. Don't like us. People say, well, did you know they don't like you? I said, good. The Bible says, beware when all speak well of you. We've never had any problem with that. There's always been a bunch of people who hated the ground we walked on. A lot of those people have, no, those persons have no bodies. But they live in bodies. They troop in here once in a while. They come in to straighten us out every once in a while. We show them where the door is and they go out. <clears throat> Speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. The last verse of that first chapter says, These people who are religious profess to know God, but in works they deny him. They give a lot of lip service to God. They just literally, they have diarrhea of the mouth running off about religious stuff. Oh, they just, oh, oh, Jesus, sweet Jesus, sweet Jesus. And they just, oh, pop, 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 they just slumped all over the place. But in their works, they're not doing anything. If they really love Jesus, they'll be teaching this word verse by verse, getting people where they can study it for themselves, where they're not dependent on a preacher or a church, but they're dependent on the Holy Spirit. They'll teach them how to walk with Jesus. And they'll get into the ministry that Jesus taught, which was evangelism, deliverance, and healing, period, exclamation point. And if you do those three things, you'll be as busy as you can be. You won't have time for a lot of other stuff. You won't build a water park. You won't build a resident hotel. hotel and you won't have time to build luxury uh, this and luxury that to attract the wealthy saps in to, to milk them dry of their money. Because that's not how God works. He never has. A lot of people think he has, but he hasn't. He's not working that way now. There's not many. The Bible says when he comes, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? And the Lord has told me for a long time, not much. Because the kind of faith he's looking for is in Romans 10, 17. Say it with me. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And I want you to know that most people are just sipping this word. They're just nipping a bite here and a bite there and a bit. They're just sampling. Uh, did you ever go get a box of chocolates and somebody had gone through and pinched them? Taking a piece of this and a piece of that. Ooh, that irritates me, especially if they pinch the one kind I like, you know. <laughs> I don't want just a piece. I want the whole thing, you know. And a lot of people have done that with the Bible. They just take a little bite here, teeny bit here and teeny bit there. And they don't know anything, really. You need to go verse by verse through the scriptures and get familiar with what these epistles are teaching. And get yourself lined up to walk with Jesus and be a blessing. Learn how to do the works of Jesus, which is evangelizing, which is delivering people from demon power and healing the sick. And then the charismatic gifts come along and they make all three of those main things that Jesus wants done stronger and more effective. The charismatic and the supernatural gifts make everything work better. If the church ever would stop doing, go out of business, 
having basketball teams and this kind of team and that kind of team and kitty car races and, and all this other kind of stuff. If they'd go out of business, is that their main focus? And getting back to the Bible, it would be shocking what the devil, what a shellacking the devil would take. I have no objection to people getting together to fellowship. That's why we do it. Every 50 years, we have a celebration. And well, we really celebrate more often than that even. But that's not the, that's not the, the tail doesn't wag the dog around here. Social events take back seat. The first and main thrust of this church is Thursday night, Sunday morning, Sunday night. You say, well, if you're so hot about it, why don't you do more? How come just three services a week? Well, we used to have more than that. We used to have four. Plus a men's prayer meeting that usually turned into a wild deliverance session that went to 3 o'clock in the mornings on Saturday night. And then the Lord told me, he said, son, a church can only be as strong as its families. If you keep the men down at the church all the time, they're never going to be able to relate to their wives, their children, and build a strong family and take care of the things that need to be taken care of at home. So we shrunk up to three services, and we concentrate on those, and we expect everybody who means business to be in all three of those services. And then the rest of the time, you say, well, what if they don't build up in their families? That's their problem. We've released the time so they'll have time to spend with their families. And I think most of our people do. They take time. Well, he says, uh, these people say they know God. They profess to know him. That's Profess means to say it with your mouth. But they deny him in their works, being abominable, disobedient, and unto every good work reprobate. You know why? Because they're so busy doing everything else religious. You can get in the religious rat race and be so religious and so holy until every breath you take is Holy Ghost, Holy Ghost, Holy Ghost. Ha, 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 hoo, hoo, hoo. The theme of your song is say how great I am. I mean, you can go around saying that, how great I am, how great I am, and think the Lord's really got something with you. He has. He's got a real problem. You see, because the devil can pump us up with religious spirits and just a little knowledge, you can get puffed up on deliverance just because you're successful throwing out demons, just because you speak in tongues, just because you prophesy, just because you've cleaned your life up. Those are exemplary things. But if you get puffed up about it, you make a fool of yourself. That's what you ought to do. And some people strut around and say, well, you know, I'm number one. And the devil said, my, aren't you something? And he said, oh, no, no, I don't believe in accepting that, but say it one more time. Sounds so good. It tickles my ear. It just has a pleasant little tickle. I, of course, won't believe it, but I'd just like to hear it one more time. I guarantee you he'll try to buy for you. We've got to realize Jesus said when the servant does what he's supposed to do, which is evangelize, deliver, and heal, and be filled with the gifts of the Spirit, and do the works of Jesus, when he does that, he's just simply doing what he's supposed to. We hadn't hung any moons yet. We hadn't put any stars on top of the building. We're still trying to learn how to be what, the, the minimum trouble is you see our church world today is so ungodly so wicked so sloppy until when you begin to even move toward the minimum of what a Christian is supposed to be wow what a super duper Christian you are and you listen to it and I think it's true I really am I must be an example for the believers. And you find out right quickly then, uh, then the way, then the contrary winds come up. Ah! Boy, what an example of the believers you are, yes. You find out you're not much of an example yet, you still got some root digging to do, go deeper. Very embarrassing. You say, how do you know? None of your business. But I know just about time that you know you, you wouldn't say it out loud because you know that's not the thing to do and you certainly would never verbalize and tell people how great you are how absolutely wonderful intelligent brilliant you are 
because you wouldn't want them to feel bad because they're so much lower than you are, you know. But then when the devil hits you with a steamroller, you find out, oh, Lord, help, help. It's back to the drawing board, and the Lord said, see, he caught you again, didn't he? We've got to stay with our feet on the ground, realizing we're just lumps of clay. And except God guide us, except he empower us, except he give us intelligence, except he give us the power to overcome the enemy, except he give us direction, understanding, and knowledge, we'd be most ignorant and most open to the stupidest traps the devil can hook up. He won't even have to get hooked. You won't have to get hooked on much. You know, I always felt sorry for people got hooked on old cigarettes, you know. The devil throws out a pack of cigarettes and pulls in a smoker. Throw out a can of snuff and he'll pull in a dipper. And uh, But you know, the one I feel almost sorry as far, he throws out an empty hook a profanity and he'll pull in a cusser. I don't know of anybody who gets less out of what they do than a cusser. Do you? I mean, at least you ought to get something out of what you're doing before God takes it takes up slack on you. Just be sure that you don't get hooked in the devil's coils. The best way is to watch out for that pride because pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before fall. Just when you throw your nose in the air, that's when you step right in the hole and fall down right in front of everybody. Pride goes before destruction. Don't let the enemy slip up on you. There's another little sneaky rascal. Jealousy. And I don't like her. I'm discerning spirits about her. Well, it's funny you never discern spirits about her until she began to achieve for the Lord. And you felt threatened. Where'd she come from? She hadn't been here as long as I have. Who's she sitting over there throwing demons out? She's like, I get proud. I better trim her a little so she won't get proud. And you appoint yourself to be the vine dresser. You better watch it. Or you have a special friend, you know. And believers do have special friends. They get close to each other in a church family. <clears throat> and then somebody new comes along. That friend of yours is spending time with them. All of a sudden, you begin to pick, 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 little rabble picker. Pick, 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 pick. Well, they're not this. Well, you have to watch out, you know. They haven't been here very long. What is it? It's jealousy, but it disguises itself. I'm protecting my friend against deception. You're not doing it. You're just being plain old jealous and stinking ugly. The devil beat you with an ugly stick and you turned out to be that way. We've got to watch that sort of thing. You know, in the body of Christ, there are people whom God equips. He, every situation you go through, every bad situation you go through, and those of you going through hard times, I have to tell you this, to be honest. Cheer up. The worst is yet to come. Somebody told me that one time, so I cheered up, and sure enough, it was worse. Whereas I had a wagon load, the next day I had a truck load. But I'll tell you this. I've lived long enough to find out that everything the devil sent to destroy me I wailed, I, I tried to back out, I crawfished, I ran sideways like a crab. I did everything in the world trying to get out of that thing. There was no escape. And I hollered to God like, come on, he's going to get me, you know. I'm losing all my spirituality. I don't even feel spiritual. I'm about half mad at you, you know. Anybody as holy as I am, what's that, what am I in this kind of position about, you know, and... But every terrible thing that you go through, God, if you'll just wait long enough for God to work it around, he'll turn that around and use that very experience for you to sit down beside somebody 
who's going through something very similar and just about to give up and you say, hang on. I went through something not exactly like it, but close by and it will come out all right. And when you see hope come into that hopeless face and when you see the tears are still flowing, but there's a little hope glimmering there, well, maybe, maybe in your heart you're going to say, thank you, Lord. I never thought I'd say thank you for that. I had some people tell me one time I was going through some hard times years and years ago. I never go through hard times anymore. Just hideous times. But back then I just went through hard times. <laughs> but, uh, and somebody told me, said, now one day when you're going to thank the Lord for this. I thought, you're out of your cotton picking mind. Never in a million years will I say thank you for this. It's stupid, it's pointless, it's ridiculous, and I refuse. <laughs> but I didn't say that out loud. I was nice. I thought, you dummy. And, uh, but you know what? And they were right. It took a while down the road. But they told me what I just told you. Someday you'll sit down beside somebody who's just dying with the pain, the heartache, and the disappointment. And you're going to look at them and say, I didn't read this in a book, but I know. And it's going to mean so much more because you can say, I know something of what you're going through. And God did something for me. And he, didn't love, he doesn't love me. Anybody loves you. And he's going to take care of this thing. And when you come out on the other side, one of these days, you're going to say, thank you, Lord. And boy, you, you watch them, they go, Bleh. and I know how they're feeling. You crazy fool. Never, never, never. But I know also they will. Because God doesn't waste anything. Even the devil's worst. He turns it around and shoots it back at the devil and makes it to be the means of setting people free. And when you meet somebody who's able to help a lot of people, you can make sure, you can just know for positive, they've been through the knothole quite a few times. That's why they know. That's, and if you're going to help people, you just got to get ready. You say, but I'm just already about like I should be. Uh-uh. Uh-uh. God still sees areas that need to be fixed. And when he gets through, you're going to be like the tomato plant that was pruned, you know. That tomato plant got out there and just grew and put up these big leafy branches. Here you walk up beside it and think, huh, look at them old suckers. Well, we can't have that. We want fruit, not, not a bunch of limbs. And you go snip, and that tomato plant says, ah! It took me a long time to grow that snip. No, oh, you're killing me. <laughs> no, no, that doesn't. And snip, 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 snip. And you know, the funny thing is, that tomato plant will now produce the most beautiful fruit. Before that, it would produce a little bit of fruit and a whole lot of leaves. See, we want to produce leaves because you can see them in a hurry. Fruit takes longer. And you know how you bear fruit, don't you? Did you go, ever go to a peach orchard where the peaches are bearing? You can tell before you get there, you know, the peaches are, the, the trees are, are growing peaches because you hear, Oh! <laughs> I can't bear it! <laughs> you say, what are you doing? I'm having a peach over here. Is that the way peach tree, peaches grow? No, they grow so slowly that if you watch, you can't hardly see them. Only with speeded up photography can you, stop photography, can you really tell how much they're growing. But what's going to happen, that peach is going to form. And God's after that fruit. He's not so interested in all that bushy, hallelujah, hip to do hallelujah stuff and bench jumping. That, that's all right. But he's going to clip a lot of that off. You won't jump near as high. After you go through the deep waters, you won't feel like jumping. You'll feel more like praying. You'll feel more like crying. You say, well, you're painting an awful gloomy picture. Well, 
if I didn't tell you the truth, you'd say, you're lying to us, preacher. That's what they're doing on the TV station, the radio station. They're lying like hounds to you. Most of these preachers are lying to the people. They're telling them, that you don't have to worry about this. You don't have to worry about it. I'm telling you, if you follow Jesus, you're going to get it. The devil's going to try to wipe you out. You say, well, you're scaring me. I don't know whether I'll walk with Jesus or not. Well, if I can scare you off, the devil would eat you up the first first time he hit and crossed your trail. You've got to have more to you than that. You've got to be determined to walk with Jesus no matter what it costs. And if you want an example, look at the Savior. You think it was easy to have all the hide whipped off your face? A bunch of adulated idiots slap you, put you through the third degree, yank your beard out and hit you on the head with a stick, put a crown of thorns on you and take all the hide off your back with a whip. You think that was easy to take? And you want a soft, easy, sweet, and lovely place. Oh, I just want to pick daisies all the time and tiptoe through the tulips and sing praise Jesus. And, uh, you know, we're such children, you know. I just want to sing, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me. Well, that's fine, and that's true. But you ought to come past that child's understanding and realize that when you enter into walking with Jesus, there's a war, an all-out war with cruel and savage foes, very powerful foes who hate you, hate your family, hate your church, hate your preacher if they're doing anything. Well, we had not even got to the second chapter yet. These religious folks, though, have destroyed so much. I just felt I ought to give a little time to them. I let you realize that you can be religious or you can walk with Jesus and learn to do his works. We only are commissioned to do the works of Jesus. We're not commissioned to do a lot of other things. We're not commissioned to be specialists in a whole bunch of things. Just evangelism, deliverance, and healing. That's it. Everything else is second, third, and fourth, fifth, however you want to put them. But our first priorities are the things Jesus wants us to do. And as I said, once you get doing these things, you don't have a lot of time left for that other stuff. If they want to play, there's a lot of churches that play, playing games. Want to play religious games? Want to get in the sports program? There's lots of churches. That's all they do. Send them over there. Let them play over there. And if they want to do all kinds of little religious doodads and never get down to the nitty-gritty of getting people saved and delivered from evil spirits... Well, you know, do you know in the average Bible teaching church, now not these birds that went over the hill years ago and threw the Bible out the window a long time ago and don't even believe the Bible. I'm talking about in the average Bible-believing churches around here, 50-mile radius of here. If what happened tonight would happen in their services, a demon would let out a war hoop, it would empty the pulpit and the pews. I mean, they would be shocked out of their little minds. There's no real danger. There's not enough power to put that thing on top. Because in the first place, you you notice what did it, didn't you? The love of the people flowing and love just burns those things, cooks them. And when the Lord said we're going to have a love feast, I thought, well, there must be one out there ready to burn. And I wasn't too surprised when it let out a war hoop back there. When the love got to flowing with the people all of a sudden let out a wild spring. And that's the way it ought to be. It ought to be in all the churches. Is it that way, though? No, it isn't, unfortunately. Can it be? No, you bet. But somebody, somebody has to get away from playing religious games and lead the people to the Word of God, to the fountain of waters, and get their minds on Jesus and on what he wants and not what the religious world is demanding. The religious world is full of saps. Praise God for Jesus. Amen. People say, well, how big is your church? I said, it's very small. But it has a big commission from the Lord. That's to wallop the daylights out of the devil by getting people saved, delivered, and healed. 
And then when they come here, they say, but it's so small. I thought it'd be bigger. I said, I don't know why you thought that. I wrote it in the books. I told you in the meetings it was a small church. It's still a small church. I don't think it ever will be very big. It's not supposed to be. This is a way station. This is a basic training camp. This is a place where people can touch base, get help, and then go out to help others. It wasn't meant to be Worley's Mausoleum. With my name on the cornerstone out there. Worley's Warriors. What a bunch of baloney. It's not supposed to be a memorial to anybody. It's supposed to be a place where Jesus can help his people and where the people just simply love his word, love him, and are standing ready to help others when they ask for it. And that's what our church is all about. That's what it's always been about. Now, you talk about battle royal, but we've had a battle royal with religious folks. I've always battled with them in my ministry because I always had a simple ministry. I never had anything complicated. I just thought the main thing was to learn the Word of God. The last 17 years, it went beyond anything I expected, but uh, that's all right, too. But we got right up to the brink of it. We were all set for it, and when we took the leap, it wasn't any big leap. It was just, just step off, and here we go again. We're going, following right along. And 17 years ago, we went into deliverance. It's gotten, the waters have gotten deeper. The religious folks have come. How many of you, I see some oldsters sitting out there. Well, that's a bad term, Alice, isn't it? You and I are not old. We've just been here a while. Uh, the, uh, but there's some of you been here long enough to see a lot of religious folks rise up and also go away. Is anybody out there like that? Oh, you know, yeah. Yeah, you can remember, can't you? You know, what, you know what made them go away? Some of you didn't know at the time if you were new. What made them go away was they tried to grab hold of the wheel and steer away from deliverance. You know what I did? Same thing I did with kids. Crack them on the head, and if that doesn't do any good, we'll apply the Board of Education to the seat of knowledge. And that, uh, some of them came experienced fighters. I mean, they were experienced in fighting churches and fighting preachers. But this old Texas Longhorn also came up here. And I was transplanted up this north land. It wasn't my idea. It was God's. And I don't have a drop of Eskimo blood in my body till this day. I always look forward to the winters with horror. And, uh, but I've survived quite a few of them. <laughs> but um, they... I've had some people walk up to me and take a look and say, well, that old boy, you know, he, he just talks and smiles and speaks soft. Well, we'll fix him. We'll, we'll, we'll work him over. We'll, we'll get this thing like we want it. Now, that's what they thought. See, they made a mistake. They, if they'd looked real close, they'd seen some long, jagged scars on this old longhorn's hide. And if they looked even closer, they'd see some gore on the horn. I was trained before I came here not to put up with some things. There's a lot of things I'll tolerate. There's some things I won't tolerate at all. Some of you see me go on the warpath. When I get on the warpath, you better move. Things begin to move rapidly. We've had religious folks try to grab the wheel on this thing, get her out of deliverance. Well, you'd expect that, wouldn't you? And guess where we are? We're right where we were. Only we have a lot more knowledge and understanding now than we did have. But we're still on that evangelism, deliverance, and healing. And, oh, there was all kinds of wonderful ideas. Let's do this, let's do that, let's do the other. And I said, no, 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 no. And they didn't like that. And then the devil would come and say, well, you are a dictator. And I take it before the Lord. He said, now... You've been preaching since 47. They just came to know about this a year ago. Now, who do you think is better qualified to decide about this if it comes down to it than you or them? And besides that, they, I gave you the vision. I said, oh, okay. After that, it was easy for me. And the door opened both ways. And some didn't like it anymore. 
Brother Willie wasn't sweet anymore. He wasn't loving. He wasn't kind. The strange thing was, the rest of the flock didn't notice it. They thought we were just going along just like we'd always gone. But you see, when you're in rebellion, disobedience, then suddenly everybody's different. You walk in and people are smile at you and think, well, what's the matter with you? If you had my troubles, you wouldn't be smiling, grinning all your silly face. You know? Or if you say hi and somebody doesn't see you and they turn away and say, she's high hat me. <laughs> Who can play that game? See, a lot of it depends on your outlook, your attitude. God puts you in here. Don't you let anybody put you out. I've never put anybody out. They put themselves out. I furnish the rope for them to hang themselves. With some, it takes, they've got a big neck. It takes a while. When God gets through spraying them up, though, they're strong. And we don't have any more problems with them. They leave. And the church picks up speed and goes forward again. We slow down to dump them and then we go. And that's not our idea, it's theirs. They profess to know God. I am so sick and tired of turning on the TV. My wife will just say, honey, turn that off. You're going to be raving in a few minutes. I'll turn on Bob Tilton. Old liver lips, bless his heart. Now I know I'm no bargain to look at, but bless his heart. And I'd like him if he didn't if he was saying anything worthwhile. Give me a thousand dollars. No, you can't send five hundred. You gotta send a thousand. God spoke to you. I'm gonna show you how to prosper whether you like it. Oh Shonda Mahanda. Well, park my mina truck too. He's showing the body of Christ how to prosper. I wonder why the money's all coming to him instead of the people that are giving, the dummies that are sending it in. And a Kenneth Hagin parading around saying, God's the greatest failure in the universe. First he lost his super angel, third of the angels. Then he lost the creation. He lost Adam. He lost Eve. And he finally didn't have nothing left but Jesus. And he had to send Jesus, and he had no assurance he'd get him back. He risked all. I couldn't believe my ears. You say, I don't believe he said that. We got a tape of it. Sharp and clear. The first one we got was fuzzy. Trinity Broadcast Network wouldn't even release any more of them. It caused such a furor. And I want you to know, Paul and Jan and the rest of them, those idiots over there clapping and laughing, thought it was just hilarious. Then when it hit the fan out there, when some people that knew better got screaming their heads off about what blasphemy this is. Now we've got a real good clear tape. Somebody shipped us one. And the blasphemy is all there. You need to know these boys are not what they say. I'm sorry. Somebody's got to say no. Kenneth Hagin is wrong. No. Oral Roberts is a liar. The Bible does not teach seed faith. It never has. That's a perversion of Scripture. It doesn't teach a lot of other things they're preaching. You say, well, huh, you're somebody talk. Here you are, a little speck on the corner. Look at that ORU. It's coming down. Wait and see. You see the PTL manure, manure pile, how long it took for it to explode? How many of you can remember that for years I'd predicted PTL would come tumbling down? because of it had basic rottenness. I preached it all over the country, and I was a kook head. But she came down, I had a lot of people say, you know, you told us that five, ten years ago, didn't you? I said, yes, you did. I said, it had the roots of rottenness in it. So has ORU. So has Rama. You can't build on false doctrine and let it stand. It won't work. God is obligated to pull that thing down. I don't care how many million people gets involved in it. God is not involved in the great numbers. Did you know that? You remember what happened to Mr. Gideon? Must I review? 32,000 against about a quarter of a million. That's not too good of odds. Poor General Gideon. 
God said, sorry, you got too many. Tell everybody that's scared to go home. 22,000 left. My Lord, he didn't have anybody to start with. And God looked down and said, still too many. How many did he whip them with? 300. Despise not the day of small things. Listen. A little old bumble bleak can chase a great big mule all the way across the pasture. All I have to do is sting its rump every once in a while. And that, and that mule will gallop and run for its life. And we may not be very big, but we've got a stinger that'll make that mule rare and pitch. I'll tell you that. And we're learning how to place it better all the time. And our job is not only to do it ourselves, but teach every believer that listen how to do it. And if we get a whole swarm of those things after that rascal, he's really going to have problems on his hands. And that's why all the sm smashing attacks, that's why the hatred against deliverance is because it's the only ministry that has the power to knock the enemy out of the saddle. And he knows it. Evangelism is wonderful, but it won't knock him out of the saddle. Miracles of healing and supernatural wonders are great and marvelous, but they won't knock the devil out of the saddle. The reason the early church succeeded was because ahead of them, like a cow catcher on a locomotive, went deliverance, which scooped up everything and tore up that ancient world, which was steeped in witchcraft. They didn't have anything but witchcraft. And it ripped through that witchcraft just like going through tissue paper. And there was nothing could stop it because deliverance from evil spirits was the key to getting people saved, keeping them walking with Jesus was the key to supernatural wonders and healings and the church swept like a victorious flame across. They couldn't kill them fast enough to stop the message from going. They tried killing off the Christians. It did work. You don't have much chance with somebody who says, if you cut my throat, I'll go to heaven. How do you like that? But see, now we've got a bunch of little molly collars. They want to stay around, enjoy their Mercedes and their home by the lake, and, and they want to vacation, and they want to recreate, and they, they, I don't want anything hard or difficult. I will say the Lord's Prayer. Now lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. Why I should die before I wake. Please wake me up, for goodness sake. There are some people, their ignorance is appalling. They don't understand anything in the spiritual realm. And it's the fault of the preachers who have not taught them the truth. They've led them to believe an easy road. It's not an easy road we're traveling. It's a hard road. Jesus said it's a narrow road. Not many are going to find it. He said it's a hard road. Take up your cross daily. And follow me. A cross is an instrument of death. It has only one purpose, and that's to kill you. I haven't heard any of these turkeys lately saying, take up your cross. They say, take out your wallet. Take out your checkbook. No, take up your cross and follow Jesus. You know why? Because they're not doing it themselves. And you can't preach what you're not doing. And you can't convince others of what you're not practicing. It just won't work, people. And you might as well figure out, too, that you're going to be, this is going to be a lonesome road for you. You're going to have to learn to be satisfied with Jesus. Every once in a while, you're going to bump into some believer that's got some sense. And, oh, what a refreshing it is. Oh, good, I can talk. Oh, it's so good to fellowship with somebody. That's why people like to come to Hackers. From all over the country they come, even other parts of the world. And they say, how refreshing, because the believers love each other. This is so rare, and it shouldn't be. It's wrong for it to be rare. It should be, the, it should be ordinary. It should be everyday. It should be part of every church. But the enemy has managed to set the believers against each other. The only way we can do, we can't do about other people, we can get ourselves straight. It's better to be a sermon than to preach one. Get your life together. Let Jesus do something with it. If you've never asked Jesus in your heart or you're not sure you have, would you like to tonight? He said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I'll come in. 
If you've never settled that, that's the first thing you've got to get settled. If it's not settled and you can't get it settled where you sit or where you stand, don't hesitate to come down the aisle, tell the boys here at the front, I need to talk to somebody about salvation. If that's not your problem, but you're driven, you're harassed, you're tormented, this is producing compulsive behavior, which is slowing down, stopping, or reversing your spiritual growth and progress, then you need deliverance from evil spirits. It's just that simple. You say, well, somebody told me there was one wrapped around my neck. Well, I wouldn't worry about that one. Somebody told me there's one around my elbow and one around my leg. Don't worry about those. Worry about the ones on the inside. That's the, that's the boys that bother you. These signs shall follow them that believe my name, shall they cast out devils, speak with new tongues, lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. Friend, the table is spread. This church is a full gospel church. We don't have special services. The table is spread with evangelism, deliverance, and healing, and the gifts for every service. Our people are equipped to minister. That's what they live for. They live to do the works of Jesus. They've been trained, and you can get one-on-one -on -one help here in a hurry. We're going to stand and sing something about that name. If you need help, if you want prayer, come quickly to the front. Don't wait until the workers are all gone now because we'll use them up. And if you're coming for the first time for prayer, you can cut the line and come down the middle. You don't have to observe the line. You can just go right straight to the front and get the first of the workers.